Hidden below the surface of the rich Nile Valley soil, a treasure buried for nearly 2,000 years was suddenly unexpectedly revealed. In 1945, a farmer in Upper Egypt, digging for fertilizer by a cliff, uncovered a huge six-foot jar. In it were 13 ancient leather-bound papyrus codices, what we now know as the Gnostic Gospels. They turned out to be one of the most important biblical finds of the century. Written in Coptic, or ancient Egyptian, the early Christian documents contained 49 treatises of the Gnostic sect. In those books, there were many other Gospels that, that never had been part of the New Testament, many of which we hadn't known, except we knew that in the ancient world um, there had been many Gospels, but they were buried, they were destroyed, they were burned by leaders of the church who regarded them as the most abominable kind of heresy. So we never knew what the heretics said, we just knew that they were terrible. And now we finally hear them speak in their own words. The text revealed stunning new information about the struggle between beliefs that arose after Jesus' death Gnosticism's essential theme is that divinity is not an external force, such as that embodied by Jesus, but an inherent internal capacity available to every human being. These Gospels have a kind of different message because the Gospels that were chosen to be part of the New Testament between the second and the fourth century basically have a similar message. They say, believe in Jesus and you'll be saved. These other texts, like the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, says that the divine is to be found within you because we're created in the image of God and therefore there's a continuity between the divine and the human. What you find in these other texts are many different points of view and that's what some of the fathers of the church didn't like. Irenaeus, the bishop who hated heretics, said outside the church there is no salvation. Everybody must believe and it's through the church that you can be saved. Outside you're lost. Until the discovery of the Gnostic text, most of what was understood about Gnosticism came through the writings of early church fathers who vehemently condemned it. Tertullian, one of the leaders of the church, said, people are always asking questions. It's questions that make people heretics. It's questions that, that prompt all of the explorations that you find in these various texts. One of the texts the Pistis Sophia, which scholars date from 250 or 300 AD, sheds new light on how other ideas of Jesus' ministry fought to be heard during the effort to make official doctrine out of Christian traditions. The text features a remarkable argument between the Magdalene and the Apostle Peter. Peter complains to Jesus, Mary is talking all the time. She should keep silent and say nothing. And in that text, Jesus encourages her to talk. You can see why this is not part of Catholic tradition. Another important Gnostic text is the Gospel of Mary. The few text fragments that exist indicate that the Gnostics held Mary in high esteem as a visionary, apostle, and leader. In one significant passage, Mary reveals to other apostles that Jesus has shared secret teachings with her. So you find actually in the Gospel of Mary that it's Mary who receives teaching from Jesus that isn't revealed to anyone else, not even Peter, not even his special disciples. If you look at the Gospel of Luke, it's Peter who's the leader, Peter is the spokesman, Peter is in charge. When you look at the, the Gospels that speak of Mary Magdalene, Peter is the foil, and Mary Magdalene becomes the prominent disciple. Peter is always complaining about her. The Gnostic texts transform Mary Magdalene into the pivotal figure of early Christianity, with an authority unmatched by the other disciples. This version is remarkably different from the accepted canon. In the Gospels of the New Testament, like Luke, for example, Luke talks about the disciples and the women. And the disciples aren't the women, and the women aren't the disciples, and that's very clear. But in some of the secret Gospels that were found, women are among the disciples, and among that group, Mary Magdalene is the most prominent. The last pope said, there can be no women priests because our Lord was a man and he only chose male disciples. Now, if you had the Gospel of Mary in the mix, that statement could not be made. 
The Gnostic texts represent just one of the possible revisions of the Mary Magdalene story. It begs the question, what other versions of the Magdalene story might there have been? The relationship between Jesus and Mary Magdalene has been hotly debated since the earliest days of Christianity. This provocative subject has once again ignited a firestorm of discussion. In the Da Vinci Code, Dan Brown makes an extraordinary statement that inverts what we know of texts outside the canon. He makes texts like the Gospel of Mary and the Gospel of Philip into historical documents. Why? Because they contain evidence of a marriage between Jesus and Mary Magdalene. Now, that, that sets every piece of scholarly work that we have done for 2,000 years on its head. The Gospel of Philip, a Gnostic text, describes a love between Jesus and Mary that may have been sexual. Most of the Jewish leaders, almost all, 98, 99%, were married and had children. They were following the biblical injunction to be fruitful and go forth and multiply. It was accepted convention if you were a 32-year-old man, as Jesus is described in the accepted gospels, to be married and to have children. Uh, so many scholars look at that cultural evidence that if Jesus were a real human being, and if he did come out of Jewish culture, he almost certainly would have been married. And who would he be married to other than this Mary of Magdala, who's mentioned 12 times by name in the accepted gospels, who's at every important place in the story of Jesus. I think that the recent interest in making Mary Magdalene Mrs. Jesus, or the lover of Jesus, uh, in part has to do more with Jesus than with Mary Magdalene. And what I mean is, if he's going to be a real guy, he's going to have to have a woman, right? And that's another way of using a woman to think about a man. How likely is it that Mary Magdalene shared a deeper relationship with Jesus than the New Testament suggests? The anointing scene, often pictured with Mary holding an alabaster jar, may have contained important symbolic clues. The idea that a woman is touching the feet of a man in a kind of erotic or semi-erotic gesture, wiping with her hair, you know, it's a, it's a pretty sexy scene. So, therefore, they take it to indicate that this woman, it, who they mistakenly think is Mary Magdalene, is married to Jesus. Some people are viewing the anointing ritual that's present in all four Gospels as uh, reminiscent of Heros Gamos rituals that took place in the Mesopotamian region. Heros Gamos is a sacred marriage that we find in many pagan religions where the idea is that the, there is a heavenly king and a heavenly queen in the divine world and that's mirrored in the lower world and that sex between a man and a woman could mirror the sex in the, in the heavenly kingdom. Ancient people believed they could gain profound religious experience through Heros Gamos, a sexual union usually performed by the Lord and a woman in the community. It provided symbolic and literal fertility for themselves, the land, and their people. But is there evidence that Mary Magdalene and Jesus were more than symbolic sexual partners? The Gospel of Philip has a very provocative passage which says, Jesus loved Mary Magdalene more than all the other disciples and used to kiss her often on her, and then the text breaks actually, but most people think mouth is the appropriate word to put in that blank space. In the text itself, the suggestion is made that Jesus and Mary Magdalene are a pair. But the suggestion there is that she represents the Holy Spirit and that she is a manifestation of the feminine aspect of the divine. Many within traditional religion invoke the Magdalene's role as the apostle to the apostles as an argument for female priesthood, 
while others see her relationship to Jesus as a deeper connection to a pagan past. There were mystery religions in the Roman Empire, and in some of these mystery religions, goddesses were venerated. And it's believed by some that there were priestesses or sacred prostitutes who carried out the rituals of, of these goddesses. And so some people believe, based on the anointing ritual, that Mary Magdalene could have been a priestess of Isis, carrying out the Heros Gamos ritual with Jesus. Isis is the wife of Osiris. Osiris uh, is killed, his body is cut into pieces. Isis and her sister Nephthys put him back together, anoint his body, and stay with him for three days. And at the third day, he comes back from the dead. So this idea of the anointer um, and the one who waits for three days by the tomb is, is not an uncommon connection. Every god in the ancient Near East, a Roman god, a Greek god, an Egyptian god, would have a female partner. So it's quite unusual that the god of Israel is depicted without one. And we know that these images of a feminine partner for God were certainly suppressed in antiquity. The earliest religions worshipped goddesses. There were goddesses before there were gods. They see sex and sexuality not with the taboos and inhibitions that we see, but with a sense of ecstasy, a sense of birth. And all of this, seen through the prism of today, is now being layered onto the Mary Magdalene character, that somehow she represents all of this. Today, as in the early days of Christianity, Mary Magdalene embodies what the Orthodox Church has lost the sacred feminine. Could Mary Magdalene represent the female face of God? We know that in Christian tradition, in Jewish tradition, God is always described as masculine. In these other texts, often you find God spoken of not only as father, but also as mother. This isn't an insignificant idea. It moves people very, very deeply. If the feminine voice has been sacrificed in the battle for orthodoxy, Mary Magdalene may hold the key to restoring it. The discovery of the Gnostic Gospels and their startling image of Mary Magdalene as a powerful leader among the apostles has had a significant impact on women in traditional Christianity. She arises once more as the model disciple um, and as the model proclaimer of the gospel of Jesus. Mary Magdalene is tenacious enough not to give up. When all the other disciples had gone, she had not. Now, doesn't that somehow embody the tradition of absolute devotion beyond the grave? And I think that's part of the interest in the figure of Mary Magdalene in terms of devotion beyond the rational. The Church finally agreed to represent Mary Magdalene in a different light. In 1969, the Vatican rectified Pope Gregory's miscasting of her as a sinner and began referring to her instead as a disciple of Christ. I think that that role that Mary Magdalene has as apostle to the apostles, as the first one to experience uh, the presence of the risen Jesus, is one that is certainly relevant for our time. What we now know about the Christian movement is that it's enormously wider than what we call Orthodox tradition. We thought, well, you know, we know about Jesus and the disciples and everything comes from that. But now we see a much wider range of Gospels and, and perceptions. We see texts like the Dialogue of the Savior in which Mary Magdalene with Matthew and Thomas are major disciples and takes a major role in the questioning. She's spoken of as the woman who understands all things. This understanding is not an intellectual process. It's a matter of, of wisdom of the heart. And that's what these so-called Gnostics are seeking. It's not some kind of conceptual idea. It's about spiritual depth.